Thank you for inviting me. This is a great pleasure to give this talk. Um, I will talk about challenges in cancer genomics and through mostly giving examples through work done here at the Broad Institute. So first of all, what is cancer? And how did it get there? And what are cancer genes? So we all start from a fertilized egg. As cells divide, they accumulate mutations. Many of them are corrected by repair mechanisms, but some of them are stay in the genome. And these are, typically, they don't do anything. Maybe they are slightly deleterious. These are passenger events. And then at some point in life, could be a, a first driver event that gives a fitness advantage to those cells, and they start to divide faster and grow a, a clone of cells. They continue to accumulate passenger events, and then maybe one of those cells gets another, dri another driver event and gets even a bigger fitness advantage and grows even faster than the other cells and starts to take over the, the population of cells. And here's another one driver event and a driver event, and there are many, many passenger events on the way. This is the last clonal driver event, meaning that all the cancer cells are, are, have that mutation and all mutations that happened before that, all the way to the fertilized egg. Here are additional mutations that are subclonal, meaning that they only occur in subsets of the cancer cells. It's like, like populations and, uh, in, in population genetics, subpopulations of, of, uh, of uh, people could have some SNPs in them and others will, will not. At the end of the day, when we take a piece of tumor, it contains all the tumor cells with all of this heterogeneity and normal cells that are basically don't have any of these, uh, of these mutations that are common to the cancer cells. So it started from a cancer, a normal cell that had normal genome. And the, the genome of the cancer is typically highly rearranged with many mutations. You see copy number changes. Different chromosomes go to different locations. In terms of mutations, the, the typical rate is roughly one mutation per megabase. So there are many mutations in the genomes. Could be from 300 to 3,000 or 30,000 mutations in the, in the point mutations in the genome. But only 5 to 20 of them are actually the ones that driver events that give, gave the fitness advantage to those cancer cells. So at the end, as we said, we take this piece of tissue that contains cancer cells and normal cells, and we grind it up. We take DNA or RNA or proteins, whatever we want to study, and we put it in a tube. And let's say it's DNA or RNA. We sequence it, and that's what we're going kind to of analyze. So just to get the names right, the, a driver event is an event that increased the fitness of the cells when it occurred. And a cancer gene is genes that harbor driver events. For example, BRAF is a cancer gene in melanoma, and it's mutated in roughly 50% of the melanoma patients. By the way, feel free to, to stop me with questions. So how can we find those, pa those cancer genes and pathways? So to do that, um, cancer genome projects kind of have emerged. And they have two major tasks. One I call characterization, which is taking an individual patient, taking a blood sample that represents the germline, the average of those cells in the blood represent the germline DNA, a, a tumor sample that contains the tumor uh, uh, genome, and maybe a metastasis or a relapse. So all of those samples from the same patient we need to characterize them. Basically say, what are the full set of genetic events or epigenetic events that went all the way from the germline to the primary and to the somatic or the relapse, like copy number translocations, rearrangements, point mutations, what are the mutational processes that were active in this individual, what's the heterogeneity in that tumor. All of this is the characterization problem. <clears throat> Then there's the interpretation problem, where we take these characterization data across a population of patients, and then we ask different questions. What are the genomic alterations that are statistically significant in this population beyond what you expect by chance? What are the genes and pathways that have those mutations more than you'd expect by chance? What are the subtypes of the disease? Are the subtypes and the events correlated with clinical parameters and things like that? This is the interpretation task. Statistically, the, the power, the statistical power in these kind of problems to answer the characterization comes from, for example, the depth of sequencing, the, the re reducing the error rate of sequencing, longer reads and insert sites. This gives us more power to detect events. The power to solve these kind of questions comes from the number of patients that are, that are the more patients we have, the more power we have to find these, these events. 
So all of these, um, all of these projects were possible due to this famous graph that you all probably have seen before is the drop, the dramatic drop of sequencing cost in the last decade or more, um, which has gone more than a million fold. And the ability to technology is the ability to capture only parts of the genome that we want to sequence because uh, even if we, we want to sequence, if we want to sequence many patients, then sequencing only the exome, for example, is, is still cheaper than sequencing the entire genome. So there are several cancer genome projects in the world. The US started a pilot uh, project in 2006 called the Cancer Genome Atlas and then extended it to 2009. This project is, is basically supposed to end uh, this year um, with the idea of, of studying, now it's even more than 25 tumor types because some tumor types are smaller collections, but the idea is to, to study large, large number of tumor types 500 tumor normal pairs in each tumor type and perform a whole set of experiments on each one of these samples. Whole exome sequencing, 10% roughly of them whole genome sequencing, 20% low pass whole genome sequencing, RNA seq both for mRNA and microRNAs, SNP arrays to get the uh, um, genotypes and copy number, methylation arrays to get uh, uh, methylation status of uh, DNA methylation status, and uh, uh, proteomics by reverse phase uh, protein arrays. The International Cancer Genome Consortium is an umbrella organization for many of such um, projects around the world with the idea of studying 50 tumor types, again, the same kind of study design of 500 tumor normal pairs in each study. The primary goal of these projects is to identify the cancer genes and pathways, those that basically harbor those driver events. So we should expect a flood of these data from these projects and additional projects, in particular as these, this technology comes into the clinic and we'll have more and more um, panels of genes and then exomes and then genomes being sequenced, we, we would expect to see millions of genomes with, with a kind of an extremely large number of sequence bases. So what are the challenges in the characterization? Again, what is our role? A goal is to get complete base level characterization of a tumor, to understand the exact genome. The, the kind of the, the dream would be to know the exact sequence of the genome in every cancer cell that exists. Clearly, that's still, still not reality, but that's kind of where we would like to head to. We would like to know from this, these genomes to understand or, or infer the evolutionary history and the mechanism that shaped that genome. So it's like archaeology a bit. We get the sample today of the tumor, but using those mutations, we could infer what was the history of that tumor. And in some cases, we get multiple time points, so we could actually measure what happened during different time points of the evolution of the cancer. Massively parallel sequencing, also known as next generation sequencing, enables to, to get to this base level resolution. There are several challenges. I will go over them and uh, uh, one by one. So the first one is, is the flood of data. As you know, as I said, this is the drop of sequencing cost. This is the famous Moore's law in which computers are getting kind of faster and both uh, storage and, and CPUs. As you see, sequencing becomes cheaper uh, as time goes by as, com as compared to computers. What that means, first of all, that we'll have a lot more sequence to handle. That's one thing. So handle constant flow of large amounts of data. But most importantly, the fraction of the cost of the compute is increasing compared to the overall cost of these projects. So we need to store these data, we need to, to analyze these data, so the fraction of, of money that goes to actually analyzing is growing in, every time, as, as time goes by. Um, analysis must be automated and standardized and, and uh, reproducible. We developed a system called Firehose in which we are putting all our tools to enable reproducible science and, and do it at scale. We are now building it in the cloud with a, with a project called the NCI Cloud Pilot, and, uh, and we are looking forward to kind of extending it to the, to the world. And results should be accessible and easily interpretable. We need to develop visualization tools and reports, etc. One of the visualization tools that many of you use calls IGV, developed here at the Broad, to, uh, to look at sequencing data. So what can we see in cancer? We sequence these fragments of DNA, the two ends of them, we align to the genome. We could find 
a point mutation that is different in the cancer compared to the, to the germline or the, uh, of that patient. We could see indels. We could see copy number changes by just the number of, of reads the, the, uh, in that region. We could identify translocations by seeing, for example, one end of the read going in chromosome one and the other one in chromosome five. And we could also identify non-human sequence in the sample that, are, that could be a pathogen or viruses, for example, that could cause cancer. In order to find each of these events, we developed multiple tools, like Mutech to find point mutations, Indelocator for indels, SegSeq for copy number, and, and also CapSeg, Deranger and Breakpointer for, for finding rearrangements and identifying the exact uh, position of the breakpoint, and PathSeq to find uh, um, pathogens. So the next challenge is sensitivity and specificity. So what's the consequence of actually analyzing this mixture of normal cells and tumor cells? The consequence of that is uh, with a, a very important notion of the mutation allelic fraction. So the mutation allelic fraction is the fraction of alleles or DNA molecules that actually contain the mutation. So if this is, again, the tumor sample that we're analyzing, and it has some purity, some fraction of the cells are actually cancer cells. And the mass of the DNA in cancer cells is not the same as normal cells. It's what we call the ploidy of the cells. It's the average absolute copy number along the genome. If you have those two numbers, you could calculate what is the, the relative concentration of the cancer DNA in this tube. So what's the fraction of, of, of cells and what's the overall amount of DNA coming from a cancer cell compared to a normal cell. So, so here's an example. Here's a tumor sample that has two-thirds cancer cells and one-third normal cells. And the cancer had to have happened to have four copies in that region of the genome, and there was a clonal mutation in both of those cells in one of those alleles. So the purity is two-thirds. The absolute copy number in this area is four. The multiplicity, meaning how many copies per cancer cell, is one. And the allele fraction that is basically two mutated alleles out of 10 overall, so it's 20% allele fraction. So 20% of the reads would expect to have the mutation, and 80% will not have the mutation. What happens if the mutation occurs only in a subset of the cancer cell, for example, in 50% of the cells? Then, of course, if the CCF, what we call the cancer cell fraction, is 50%, then the allele fraction, instead of being 20%, will be 10%, meaning only 10% of the reads would have the mutation. So that, of, of course, affects our sensitivity to find mutations. So how do we characterize the quality of a, of a mutation detection tool? The signal that we want to look for is between 0.1 to 100 mutations per megabase. So we would like the, the specificity to be high, meaning that the false positives would be less than one, for example, 0.1 mutation per megabase. In order to characterize a, uh, uh, um, a mutation detection tool, it's basically a classifier. What is a point mutation? It goes base by base in the genome and says, is there a mutation here? Is there a mutation here? And we want that classifier to be accurate. So we calculate the specificity of the, of the classifier and the sensitivity. And we can calculate this curve called the ROC curve, which is the sensitivity as a function of 1 minus the specificity or the false positive rate. The, the sharper this curve is, the better the, the, the classifier or the, or the mutation detection tool. The issue is that there's not, only, not one curve like that. There are many curves. That curve depends on the allele fraction of the mutation, the depth of coverage in the tumor and the normal, the, the sequencing and alignment noise. So there are parameters that would affect this kind of curve. So I'll give you an example for one tool. Yes? Isn't this very s similar to just finding the somatic mutation rate in peripheral DNAs? Isn't the problem identical? You've got 3 5%. And since the sensitivity and specificity of the methods are pretty set, it comes down to the depth at which you do these things for the most part? Yes, the depth is a crucial parameter but in our sensitivity. It's a problem of the somatic mutations in Mendelian disease. Well, Mendelian disease, you mean the in... Yes, you mean when you talk about um, mosaicism. Absolutely, it's the exact same problem. And, and when uh, we have collaborations here at the Broad with, with Ben Ebert and, and others that look at mosaicism, where we're basically doing the same analysis, using the same tool to find the mutations that are tuned to look for 
for mutations that are not at 50% or 100% like, like germline events, that are, any that are any percent could be in the population of cells. And what limits us is only the depth of coverage. As we sequence deeper and the, the, the sequencing noise. As we sequencing deeper, we could find more mutations. So here's an example with, um, the, um, by, of Mutech for finding point mutations developed by Chris Sobalskis. Um, here at the Broad, it's available at this URL. Uh, before we go dive to, to the mutex, I want to give you kind of an uh, intuitive understanding of the sensitivity and specificity. So the, imagine that we have a, a cancer that is two-thirds uh, cancer cells and a mutation that is subclonal, meaning the allele fraction is 0.1. And let's say we sequence that sample to a 30x coverage and, and because we sequence to a 30x coverage, the number of reads that we expect to see the mutation is a binomial distribution with this flip of a coin of 10%. So there's a probability that there will be no alternate reads at all. So it's 4% that we won't see any alternate read. There's 14% um, that we see one alternate read, 22% that we or 23 that we see two alternate reads, etc. So that basically gives us an upper bound to the theoretical sensitivity. For example, if there are no reads with the alternate, we won't find the mutation, right? So we can't be more sensitive than 96% in this scenario. So, and if we, if we need uh, uh, at least two reads to call a mutation, will be 81%. If we need three reads, we'll need 60% sensitivity, et cetera. So that gives you an, in, an intuition for the sensitivity. What is the specific? What are the types of errors that we make, false positives? There are two types of false positives that we make. One if there was actually no event, and due to sequencing noise, we think there was a somatic event here, you see these mutations here, and no mutations here, and, we, and that's actually all noise, that's kind of a, one type of false positive. The other type of false positive is that it was actually a germline event at that site, but for some reason we didn't cover well the normal to have observed the germline event, and we now look at the tumor, we see the event, and when we compare them, we say, oh, there seems to be a somatic event here, and that's a different type of event. Yes? Can you explain, maybe it's, uh, it's not something that we should notice, but why in the no events case, the tumor is so much more noisy than the, than the normal? It, it happens. It happens that, uh, that um, sequencing noise depends on the experiment condition, experimental conditions, the run, the, the, a, lot of, a lot of parameters uh, affect the, the quality of the bases in a, in a particular region. Some of those could be also alignment artifacts that, that for some reason not happen in the normal for, um, of, that, uh, of that patient. Uh, for example, if a region was amplified in the tumor, that, that some reads from there could uh, uh, align to this region, you'll get more reads of that, uh, of that region coming to this region. So there are multiple sources of these, of these artifacts. And yes. Are you finding systematic changes, like if you did FFPE tissue compared to sort of blood DNA? Are there specific genes yes. and nucleotides that always appear mutated? That's a question. Yes. The 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 question was. Do we see systematic uh, errors that are coming from, for example, FFP versus frozen tissue? Absolutely. FFP has its own signature of, of mutations. There are, there are um, different mechanisms that cause artifacts. There was one artifact we detected here at the port broad um, connected to oxidation of, of the DNA, that some samples had it and some samples did not. And when we, if the tumor had it and the normal did not, we would find these somatic mutations and they are, and they are artifacts, that are not real mutations. Yes, Moran. Would you say that the second error is less critical because well, we again, as we said in the characterization phase, we want to find all the somatic events, and we want to distinguish between germline and and somatic. Some of those germline could be important as well, and we will will analyze the germline. But make calling this a somatic event is a mistake, and we want to avoid these mistakes. However, since we're covering the normal typically well, we, we don't have these mistakes. So we could control very well of not having these mistakes. These ones are the most common mistakes that we make. Again, giving you an, an uh, kind of a, uh, intuitive uh, understanding of this, imagine that all bases were what's called Q30, meaning that they have an error rate of one incorrect sequence based in roughly 3,000 sequence bases. 
And assuming the errors are independent, which is incorrect, and the sequencing therefore is 30x, 99%, 99 percent, 99.7% of sites will have no error. If you put 30 reads one on top of the other, um, there are only 30, and there's 3, 000, uh, one in 3,000 mistakes, so most of the sites would not have an error. But 0.3% but of sites will have one error, and, and uh, five in a million will have two errors. Now, if our mutation caller was excited, even if we saw one mutation, it will say there's a somatic mutation here, we will make a mistake in 0.3% of, of the genome. That's very large compared to the signal we're looking for. We're looking for mutations in less than one per million. So we need at least three, three reads to support the mutation to make sure that we don't make uh, uh, mistakes that are more than our signal. So that's basically, if you want to have a rule of thumb, we need three reads to find the mutation. Clearly, as we get deeper coverage, that three would increase slow, slowly with, with that coverage. In reality, this, the math is a bit more complicated, and this is what's going on inside of Mutect. We actually have uh, some filtering of reads that are noisy reads, we throw them away. Then we, we have some Bayesian kind of classifier, and then we have some filters to remove uh, uh, candidate mutations. Then we have a very important step called the panel of normal, where we compare the mutations that we find to a panel of, of normal samples to remove additional artifacts, and, and then we basically annotate whether it's a germline or somatic event. So if we go even deeper to that, the mathematics of this, we are comparing in the Bayesian model two statistical models, the likelihood of two statistical models. One, where there's actually a mutation in that site with some unknown frequency f, versus a null model where the, all, the, all the variation comes from noise, sequencing noise. And this is what basically the math that is in, the, in this, uh, it's assuming kind of independent error mo model, and basically using the, Q uh, the quality scores of the bases to estimate the error at every base. Then we have some priors, of course, it's more likely that this base is not mutated, so we, need, we have a prior of, of mutated versus not. We add those to the, we, we put it in the kind of the calculation, and, and this is the basic mathematics that goes inside uh, Mutect. So how do we measure specificity and sensitivity? We developed this idea called the virtual tumor. We, we took a sample that you're all very familiar with, which is NA12878, and we took two different runs of sequencing it, and we call one run normal, and we call the other one tumor, and we, and we call mutations. Now, every mutation that we'll find will be a false positive, because it's the exact same sample. So that's a measurement of false positive. And now we could vary the depth, we could vary uh, uh, different parameters, and, and measure the, the, the specificity as a function of these parameters. How do we measure sensitivity? We take the parent of this, of this sample, where we know where there are germline events, and we spike in or replace reads of, of, that, of that normal, basically, of that of, of virtual tumor, replace normal reads with these variant reads here. So we know exactly where the variants are, and we know, uh, and, and we know exactly how many we put there. And then we compare this, we call this the tumor and this the normal, and now we could measure our sensitivity and, as, in a controlled fashion. So we actually did that. And when, when you see, here's the, the depth of sequencing, and here are different sensitivity curves, um, and this is different allele fraction. So clearly, if the allele fraction is high, we, have, we don't need many reads to find the mutation. But if the allele fraction is low, we need many, depth of, of 60 and more to find mutation. And if we really want to cover the, uh, very well the exome, we need uh, hundreds of X coverage, which is what is done now in clinical use to find all the mutations. We also could generate this ROC curve, which is this, again, the, the sensitivity as a, as, a, as a function of false positive rate, and we compare to other uh, mutation callers, and, and, uh, and, and Mutect, our mutation caller, had the, for the same level of false positive, has the highest sensitivity, so, so we were happy with that. Um, okay. There's another, a third type of false positive. A third type of false positive comes from the, a potential artifact where some DNA from a different individual, by mistake, goes into the tube of, of my individual. So if, if a different individual would have a little bit of their DNA into our tumor, and then we'll compare to our normal, what we'll see, a few reads coming from, a few kind of alternate reads coming from, the, from that individual, and nothing in the normal, we'll call it a somatic mutation, but this is not a somatic mutation, this is just contamination. 
However, these will typically be in DB SNP sites. So we have actually developed a method called contest, which use, looks at all the SNPs in the genome and, and the ones that are typically, uh, basically are homozygous uh, reference and, and sees what level of, of contamination we see in those DB SNP sites and we estimate the contamination and we feed this contamination back to Mutect so it will now know to compare the signal to a potential contamina contaminated site. So now we ran this across a, a, a large number of samples in a project with Mike Lawrence, Peter Stoyanov, Paz Polak was here in the crowd and, and Eric Lander. We looked at, uh, at the um, at 3,000 exomes from 27 tumor types, and this is what we see. These are the different tumor types. This is the frequency of, of somatic mutations along the genome in a logarithmic scale. As you can see, there's more than three orders of, of magnitude difference uh, between different samples, and, and sometimes within the same tumor type, between tumor types and, and within tumor types. On this end, with a low frequency of mutations, there are hematologic or childhood diseases. And here we see ones that are driven by known carcinogen like melanoma from the sun and, and lung from the, the UV, etc. Just to comparison to, to the population genetics kind of group here, this rate here, this graph, is the common germline variance, roughly 1,000 per megabase. This is rare germline variants, which is roughly 10 per megabase, and this is roughly the rate of the Nova germline variants, which is roughly 10 to the minus 8 uh, uh, per base. So you can see that cancer kind of spans this, this range of, of, uh, of mutation rates. Looking at the mutation, we could also look at their, at their basically um, spectrum of mutations. These are the six possible mutations taking into account the symmetry of the DNA, and as you can see, Different tumors have different patterns. For example, the UV pattern is very clear with those C2T transitions. The smoking-related cancers are, are, have these C2A substitutions, which are common to, to the effect of uh, cigarette smoke. And, and we could look at that more carefully if we actually take into account the base before and the base after the mutated uh, the base. So what you see here, these are, again, six basic types of, of uh, substitutions. But now you have each one 16 possible base before and base after them. And this pattern is the common pattern that we see in many cancers. This is, for example, ovarian cancer, where we see a, have a highly elevated mutation rate of C2Ts, where those Cs are followed by Gs. And this is the standard spontaneous deamination of, of, uh, of methylated CPGs that, that become a T. And, and that's a process that also is very common in germline uh, um, um, mutations. However, when you do these kind of what we call these Lego plots across different tumor types, you see different patterns of mutation. For example, here, the, here you see the lung cancer and, and other patterns of mutations that are specific to different tumor types. One of them, we, in a project together with Adam Bass, we looked at esophageal cancer. We found this particular signature, which is AAs, become an AC. And you see these are these towers, these blue towers here. And this, we found it in esophageal cancer. It's believed to be related to kind of a, um, a gastroesophageal kind of reflux or kind of acidity of the stomach. We see it now also in stomach cancer and, and uh, in some cases. And uh, we don't really understand the, the full uh, chemistry of how this, uh, this happens. So now we could use these data to figure out what are the mutational processes. So every patient you could think every tumor has a superposition of different mutational processes that generate the mutations. And now we could try to recover those processes taking all the data. So this is a mathematical problem. Think of all these 96 possible mutations that you saw in this Lego plot and all the patients that we have. And we could put in this matrix the, the counts or the frequencies of mutations. This is a positive matrix. And we could try to basically approximate this matrix by a product of these two matrices that that are different processes that are generating mutations. And every patient has the loading or the, how much of that process is active in that patient. And, and when we do that, we could figure out different processes of mutations. For example, we could find clearly the CPG2T process. We could find the C2A kind of smoking related process. We can find another process that in a second I'll tell you what it means, and uh, uh, et cetera. So, now we could take this loading matrix and cluster the samples, and we could see that different 
by their loading. So different tumor types have distinct types. So for example, this melanoma black cluster here corresponds to C2T UV mutations. This cluster here is, is related to kind of uh, some head and neck and lung cancer. This is related to smoke. So we found this, this signature which is TPC to uh, uh, TP, mutated TPCs, which is, which is common both in, so, so this guy here, it's common both in bladder cancer and cervical cancer and head and neck. And this was associated with HPV, a virus that causes cancers in some of them, but in others was associated with, a, with an enzyme family called Applebeck and, and um, that, that caused these kind of mutations. There's another way to, to show, um, sorry, I skipped a slide. Yeah, um, there's a, another way to show this where every patient in this kind of diagram, the, the, the radius is the mutation frequency, but the angle depends on the, on the kind of most active uh, um, uh, process in that patient, and then the, the angle within the, the section is the second most active, etc. And you can see that some tumor types, here's again this HPV apple back here, melanoma is here, lung cancer is here, and uh, CPG uh, to T is, is here, uh, etc. There's a beautiful paper by the Sanger group, which, uh, which looked at 7,000 tumors and identified uh, um, uh, 21 processes. And, uh, and now this number of processes are continuing to grow, and we are continuing to, to find additional processes as well. Um, how could we estimate the purity of a, of a cancer sample? So we get this sample. We don't know that it's two-third cancer samples and third uh, normal samples. So how could we do that? So we developed a tool by uh, Scott Carter in the group, uh, developed a tool called Absolute to find this purity, absolute copy number, and cancer cell fraction. So I'll give you an intuition how it works. First, we looked at copy number data, but then we also added um, actually looking at the allele fraction of the mutations. So if you look at the genome, and you look at different regions of the genomes at, at, the, co at the different parental copy numbers, so the blue is one parent, the red is a different parent, you can see that the copy numbers along the genome fall in this histogram. Now, the, the gaps of these peaks in the histogram become narrower as the purity becomes smaller. So, for example, if they were all normal cells, there would be just one peak here. And as the, we increase the, the fraction of normal cells, those become closer and closer to each other. The issue is that they also become closer and closer to each other when we increase the ploidy of the cells. So we, we could use this data to estimate both the purity and ploidy, to fit both the purity and ploidy to the data. And here we see different potential solutions, where this means zero allelic copy number, and, and uh, one, and two, and three. And we could also identify some regions of the genome that have subclonal copy number changes. That means that they don't fit the integer value of copy numbers uh, um, along the genome. So that was a, a very important tool to then estimate what we call the CCF, which is what's the fraction of cancer cells that contain a mutation. So for every mutation, remember, we get the, the how many reads support it and how many reads are the, the, the reference or the normal in that case. So we could back calculate using the, the purity and the copy number at that site, what would be the likely fraction of cancer cells that contain that mutation. So most of the mutations are actually clonal, or a large number of them are clonal with the depth that we're sequencing. Clearly, as we sequence more, we'll find more and more subclonal mutations, because at the end of the day, every cell has a very a some, a somewhat different DNA within some bases in the genome. Um, so, but, but we are not certain what's this, what's this cancer cell fraction, because we have, we have a, um, a, a limited, a finite number of reads. So, you know, if we have five reads that support the mutation and 20 reads that, that don't, there's some uncertainty on what's this the fraction of, of uh, cancer cells that contain it. But if we assume that there are subclones, so these, these subpopulations uh, should, should go through um, some kind of uh, expansion uh, bottlenecks, we could cluster the data, and we find these spikes of subclones. So here's all the clonal mutations. Here's a subclone in roughly 50% of cells, in another subclone with few mutations at 70%, another one at 30%, and then 25 So So these are the different subclones, and each mutation has some probability to belong to a particular subclone. We could extend that, and this is a, a work that done together with uh, Kathy Wu and Dan Avilando and Peter and Scott, um, which we look at 
two time points. So instead of looking at one time point, we look at two time points of the, of the cancer, and we could see mutations that are, or mutations basically here's this cluster that was in, in time point one was 10% of the cancer cells, but in time point two was 80% of the cancer cells. So we could see evolution of, the, of different subclones. So now I want to move to the second uh, uh, task that we, we have in, in cancer genomic, which is interpretation. How do we ident distinguish the driver or uh, events or the cancer genes from the passenger events? In order to do this, it's a statistical process. We need to build a statistical model for the background mutations, those that are just, just our passengers, and then identify genes or regions in the genome or pathways that have more mutations than you'd expect by this random process. And these are candidate cancer genes. They could also reflect inaccuracies in our background model. So we developed several tools here the broad that do this uh, uh, for different types of events, GISTIC for copy number events and, and MUTSIG for um, point mutations. I, uh, I will just briefly mention GISTIC. It was done together with Ramin Barukim and Craig Mamel. Um, you could look at different patients. This is the different copy number gains in those patients. You could basically collect the evidence that there's the, of copy number gain in every region of the genome by basically summing up these these events across the, the population that you have, and this is kind of the score that you get for every region in the genome. But now, if you assume that all of these are passengers, they could have occurred anywhere in the genome with equal probability, roughly. We know now a bit better than that. So we could shuffle these mutations in the genome and generate a random a null hypothesis kind of uh, distribution, and now assign a p-value for every one of these peaks then we need to correct for multiple hypotheses, and we get the significant peaks. And this is a, a method that was you know, developed over time, and it's still continuing to being uh, developed. The other method is called MUTSIG. has a similar approach. Here are the different patients. These are different genes with different lengths. And here are the mutations that we see. We, we could, the most simple approach would be to tally the number of mutations and say, do we expect how many do you, did we expect in each re, uh, gene, and do we have more than we'd expect by chance? Clearly, longer genes would expect to have more mutations, so we, need to, we, we take that into account. And, and then uh, we could, again, calculate a p-value and, and correct for multiple hypotheses, and those that have an FDR less than 0.1, we call them candidate cancer genes. So just to kind of do the kind of the simple, sim most simple model for this kind of analysis, if we assume there's some background mutation rate of non-synonymous mutation of mu, and m is the total number of non-synonymous mutations that we observe. Under the null hypothesis, it will follow a binomial distribution. So for example, if there's a gene size of 1,500 bases, and we analyzed 500 tumors, so the total territory across all those samples is, is 750,000 bases, and if the mutation rate is 1.5 mutations per megabase, we'd expect, on average, in background, one mutation, but, and this would be the distribution. But if that gene happened, a particular gene had to have, have, let's say, 15 mutations or 10 mutations or 25 mutations, that would be much, much um, kind of a very unlikely by chance, and that would be kind of a, p, a very low p-value, and we need to correct for multiple hypotheses and, and then get the, the q-value. And this is basically what I'm saying here. We estimate the background rate, we calculate uh, p-values, correct for multiple hypotheses, and one, those genes that are with q-value less than 0.1 are candidate cancer genes. So we ran this MUTSIG tool across many different tumor types in, in, uh, in different uh, projects like TCGA and others, and we find cancer genes. And we typically see this curve that has kind of a, a, a decreasing kind of a order of, of genes. It, and let's say in this GBM we found um, uh, eight cancer genes, it doesn't mean that there are no more cancer genes, it just means that our statistical power when analyzing 84 samples stops here, there are probably many more. How do we know that? For example, in ovarian cancer, nearly all of them have p53 mutations, this is a high-grade serous ovarian cancer, but we see that there are some genes that we know are actually kind of driver uh, uh, or cancer genes with driver events, we didn't detect them as significant by this tool because they had very few, mutation, uh, very few patients mutated and we didn't have the statistical power. One thing to note is that only a few genes have mutations in more than 20% of the patients, and more, most of the genes are mutated in smaller fraction of the patients. 
So then we ran this tool on lung cancer, 180 lung cancers that has typically high background rate, and we found 450 significant genes. And a, a, a hundred of those 450 were olfactory receptors. We didn't believe olfactory receptors in lung tissue could actually cause cancer. So something was wrong with our analysis. And at the beginning, we, we didn't know what was wrong. And we also found very long genes and, and ones that have very, very large territory in the genome. We then understood what the problem is. The problem is that if you assume that the background rate is, is uniform along the genome and you take different genes, you'd expect to see a distribution around that kind of average kind of background rate. And every, any gene that had a mutation rate higher than this green line, you'd say it's significant. But in fact, if some genes in the genome, their background rate is lower and others, their background rate is higher, we will have false positives because we'll, we'll call all these genes with a higher background rate significant and, and they're actually not. So where do we get this heterogeneity in mutation rates? We already seen that there's a heterogeneity on the patient level between tumor types and within tumor type. We already seen that there's a heterogeneity on the base level uh, mutation rate. But we know, or we've, we've we identified that there's actually an effect of expression level on mutation rate due to, to potentially a, a process called transcription coupled repair, which the higher the, the gene is expressed, there's more repair, and therefore there are less mutations. So we need to take that into account. With, with a project with Mike and Peter and Paz, we also noticed that there's a high correlation of the mutation rate along the genome, which is this red line, with the replication timing. So the later the, 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 the gene is replicated, the, the, the more mutation it has. So instead of having this flat, uniform distribution of mutations along the genome, we now need to have a rugged kind of uh, model that depends on different covariates. So when we do that and take different covariates into account, this list of 450 genes with this new method, Mutzig CV, CV for these covariates, drops down to 11 genes. 10 of them make sense, were known in, the, in, in lung cancer, and the new one, HLAA, is a new cancer gene in, that we found in, in lung cancer. So that, we were very, very happy with this improvement. With this tool, then we, together with Mike and Eric, we went to um, ask in a bigger data set of 4,700 tumors, ask, well, if we analyze these data, can we detect all previously known cancer genes? Will we reveal new cancer genes? And have we completed the entire catalog? Are we done? Have we completed the entire catalog of cancer genes? Meaning those that are mutated, let's say, in more than 2% of patients. So we analyzed those 21 tumor types um, uh, with different, uh, different number of samples in each. What was striking is that 93% of the genes in the genome had at least five mutation. So in the past, if someone would study a gene and we say, oh, my gene is mutated in cancer, that's great, that's, you know, it's relevant to cancer. Every gene is, is mutated in cancer. So it's not, uh, not, you shouldn't be excited about that anymore. The question is, is it more than you'd expect by chance? So there are actually three different signals that we use to find um, cancer genes. One is the number of mutations. The other one is whether the mutations cluster. So even if there's a gene that doesn't have many mutations, but all of the mutations in that gene fall in the same residue, basically, of that protein, that suggests that there's a, something going on in that residue. Or another signal is if all the, even again, a gene doesn't have many mutations, but all the mutations fall in highly conserved, evolutionary conserved sites, that's another signal that these genes are, are uh, uh, important. So we calculate a p-value from each one of these tests, we combine them to a, to a joint p-value, and then we calculate the, the FDR and those that are less than 0.1, we call them candidate cancer genes. It's very important to look at the QQ plot, which uh, people from the uh, medical population genetics are very, are very well aware of, to see that we don't have uh, inflation, so that most of the genes follow the null hypothesis and a subset of them don't follow the null hypothesis. So we did that on 21 tumor types, and we found for every tumor type significant cancer genes, the, the shape of this, uh, the, the, the size of this bubble and the color represents the frequency of mutation. So as you can see, for example, bladder cancer, 
Most of those genes are this red color, meaning that are mutated in more than 10% of patients. And the reason that we don't see ones that are less, again, is because we only analyze 100 samples, so we don't, we don't have statistical power to find ones that are less frequent. In breast cancer, for example, we studied nearly 1,000 cases, and we see many significant genes that are roughly 1% to 2%. Many of them are kind of known cancer genes. Here's additional tumor types, uh, and, uh, and that's uh, different cancer genes that we find. Why is prostate so involved? So different tumor types have different uh, rate of mutation. Prostate is, is, uh, is likely driven, it's known to be driven by some translocation, rearrangements. So some tumors could be more driven by other forms of mutations, not point mutations. Then we asked ourselves something interesting, saying, well, if we combine all the data together and analyze all the data in one cohort, would we find new cancer genes? And so what you see here, every, every gene name is, uh, here is uh, um, the x-axis is the significance in the best tumor type that it was found and in individual tumor types, and the y-axis is the significance when we combine all the data. So many genes are significant when we combine all the data and individual tumor types. A large number of genes are not significant when we combine all the data because their signal is diluted since they are only important in one or two tumor types. But other genes were very low frequently mutated in, in each of these tumor types, but when we combine all the data, now we find them to be significant. Um, so, uh, by the way, blue genes here represent previously known cancer genes, which essentially we found all previously known cancer genes in those tumor types. Red ones are new ones that we are linked to, to cancer, and black ones is ones that we uh, didn't know yet whether to link to cancer. Um, so can we detect all currently known cancer genes? Essentially, yes. Are we finding new cancer genes? Yes, we found those 33 genes. So in order to study that, we developed this um, website to, uh, called Tumor Portal, which you could all go to. You could study by tumor type or by gene. For example, if you press AML, one of those tumor types, you see the significantly mutated genes. Again, blue represent previously known cancer gene, red, newly identified cancer gene, black ones that we couldn't yet uh, connect to cancer, or could be false positive. Uh, given that we use an FDR of 10%, we expect to have some false positives in our list. So when you press on a gene, for example, P53, you could see in an interactive way all the mutations in, in, in P53, and you could see the tumor types in which P53 is significant, and P53 is, is a cancer gene in nearly, nearly all cancer types. Here's some examples of these genes. Here's NRAS. You could see very clear hotspots in NRAS. This is a known oncogene in different tumor types. Here's a tumor suppressor gene that you see red all over. These are either nonsense on frame shift of splice site mutations that are scattered across the gene, and, and that's, a, that's a tumor suppressor gene in many tumor types. Here's APC, another tumor suppressor gene, but with very different pattern in colorectal cancer to other tumor types. So we, did, we looked at all the genes that we found, the, the, the new ones that we identified, and we identified 33 novel ones that are broken to different kind of uh, processes that could cause cancer or, or related to cancer, like antiproliferative proliferation, et cetera. For, for example, we found this GPPA gene, REB, that had a hotspot in the effector domain, and that gene was downstream from in the MAP kinase pathway, which, which kind of uh, ma makes sense for it to be a, a cancer gene. Another gene we found to be significant in AML, it's called uh, RAD21. It's pro this protein binds to other proteins that were previously identified as significant in cancer, and this is kind of related to, to uh, um, kind of uh, chromatid cohesion and uh, double straight break breaks. So um, the next question we wanted to ask is, have we completed the catalog of cancer genes? So in order to do that, we did an experiment of downsampling. We took the data that we had, for example, this is for AML, we had 196 patients, we found 26 cancer genes, and we subsampled. Let's say we had, what would happen if we had only 100 patients? Those 100 patients, we find only 19 cancer genes. We'll no longer find these as cancer genes. And then next, we look at 50 patients, and we found 20 
um, uh, cancer genes, uh, sorry, 12 cancer genes. In 25 patients, five cancer genes. So you could see there's a curve here, this downsampling curve. And we did it many times because you could downsample different subsampling of the data. And we could calculate this average curve. And we did it for all tumor types. And essentially for all tumor types, or nearly all tumor types, the curve looks to be constantly growing. So suggesting that if we had more patients, we'll find more cancer genes. So that's we did it also when we looked at individual tumor types. What happens when we add more tumor types? We see also an increase. And when we take all the data together and, and, and subsample, we see this increase. Then Mike did a very nice analysis where he broke the genes to ones that are mutated in more than 20% of patients, between 10 to 20, 5 to 10, et cetera. So you see that those genes that are more than 20% of patients, we kind of found all of them. There's no increase in them. But ones that are between 10 to 20% is increasing, but maybe starts to saturate. Hard to say when it will saturate. 5 to 10 is increasing steadily, and below that is just now starting to kind of go up. So we have more cancer genes to find. Then finally, we did a, a mathematical um, power analysis, saying how many cancer genes would we find if we had more patients, uh, given the background rate of that tumor type. Clearly, the higher the background rate, the more noise we, ha we, we have. We need more samples to overcome that noise. So what you see in this red line here, is, this is a logarithmic scale, is how many patients we'll need to find, to have at least 90% power to find genes mutated in at least 2% of the patients. The black dot represents where we are today in the sample set. We would like to reach this red curve for every one of those tumors, so we'll find all cancer genes that are above 2% of the population. On average, we need roughly 2,000 tumors, per, per, depending, of, of course, on the background uh, frequency, but um, on average, it's 2,000. So if we want to analyze 50 tumor types with 2,000, we need 100,000 tumors. It's not a ridiculous number that we could, I think we should strive to do, and we could do it kind of once in history and find all significant cancer genes in, in, in 50 tumor types. So we are now analyzing uh, the kind of the world's data with roughly 15,000 cases. Um, um, the last two kind of challenges that I want to mention before we, we uh, break for more questions is there's this notion of dark matter. When we look at Patients, here are patients, and here are the cancer genes that we're finding, both in mutation space and copy number space by, by MUTSIG and GISTIC. We, we find patients that don't have any mutation in a, in a cancer gene. So, so what causes cancer in those patients? Something is missing there. We, we know there's some driver events, but we don't know what they are. So that's why the, we call it the dark matter. We know there's some mass somewhere in the universe, but we don't know, we can't, we can't see it. So there's something there that we don't know what it is. There could be translocations. So even translocations in, in, in genes like ALKROS1 and RET in this lung cancer uh, study by, by Matthew and, and the Marcin Imelensky in his lab um, does, don't explain all of these cases. So wh what could be missing? Could be that we just didn't sequence enough samples and there are more cancer genes. And once we find more cancer genes, we'll complete this set. And actually in thyroid cancer, in, in, in TCJ project, that uh, Chip uh, Stewart here from the Broad was kind of leading the analysis of. We, we did do that. We studied 500 uh, thyroid cancer, which has a very low background rate, and we could reach nearly 95% of the, of the samples that have some known, known driver. But it could also be that there are some things that we are missing, like non-coding mutations or epigenetic changes that could drive these cancers. So the goal, again, is to, to uh, look at um, maybe 100,000 tumors, but also looking at whole genomes and, and looking, of course, at copy number changes, at RNA-seq and whole genomes for translocations and epigenetic changes to get a complete picture of all the alterations that could cause cancer. We, of course, need to go beyond primary tumors to metastases and, and study resistance and acquired resistance. And the last challenge I want to mention is that all these candidate cancer genes are just candidate cancer genes. We need to actually put these mutations in cells and see that actually they could cause cancer and they have a downstream effect that is similar to other cancer genes. So this is a project going on here at the Broad called Target Accelerator. And together with, with uh, uh, Jesse Bohm and Bill Hahn, we are doing that now with, uh, with uh, hundreds of, of mutations. So just to summarize, 
There are two tasks um, of uh, cancer genome analysis. One is characterization and interpretation. There's flood of data. We need automated tools. We need to, to uh, uh, reach kind of a high quality of uh, characterization by, by uh, systematic benchmarking and comparing our C curves. Mutation rates vary more than a thousand folds across cancer. Mutation spectra can be decomposed to patterns indicative of mutational processes. And we could identify clonal and subclonal mutation and study evolution and heterogeneity. The interpretation phase, we need significant analysis, long tail distribution. We need to take into account variation of mutation rate on the sample level, the gene level, the category of mutations, the genome in general, integrating multiple data sources. Um, uh, basically, your multiple sources uh, would identify more cancer genes, like the clustering and this conservation and, and copy number, etc. We know most cancer genes that are above 20 uh, hit most than 20% of patients, but we will need 2,000 tumors per, uh, per tumor type on average to find those that are above 2%. And there's still dark matter that we need to figure out what's going on, what, where are the missing uh, drivers that could be in the entire genome or epigenomes. And finally, we need actually experiments to prove that these are indeed cancer genes. So I want to thank the many people that are involved in this project, including Mike Lawrence, Petar, Paz, Eric Lander, of course, our cancer kind of uh, genome steering uh, group, Stacy, Levi, Todd, and Matthew, and, and others, and, and the many people here at the, in the analysis team and at the broad sequencing platform, uh, et cetera. So 